morning, church. We're going to be reading from Philippians. I'm going to read a small portion of what we're going to study together today. We're going to start in verse 12. We stand because we treasure the truth of God's word. So let's go to God's word this morning. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. And the latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. But what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I rejoice. The reading of God's word, you can be seated. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here. And it is a privilege to go to God's word with you this morning. Last week, we began a study in Paul's epistle to the Philippian church. And this church that, that was started with, with such a small amount of time and, and, and such a small moment has grown beyond Paul, what Paul could have expected. Paul and Timothy spent a short amount of time in Philippi. There were two confirmed salvations by the time they left the city, a woman named Lydia and an unnamed soldier, a jailer in the city jail. But these two, along with their families, would be the foundation that God would grow into a fully established, biblically-based church that would include elders and deacons and a congregation that would become known for their gospel partnership in the world, spreading the gospel into Europe and into the known world at the time. This partnership was built on hospitality, on generosity, on encouragement. And this is displayed by this letter, by the fact that when the Philippians learned that Paul was in prison, they sent not just a generous gift for Paul's physical needs, but they sent someone from their church to go and visit Paul and spend time with him to encourage him and to let him know that he was not alone. And therefore, Paul's letter to the Philippians is actually a response to their generosity, a response to their encouragement. And perhaps this is why the idea of joy is so prevalent in this letter. This short letter, four chapters, joy or rejoicing is mentioned over 16 times. And Paul himself calls these believers in Philippi his own joy and crown. So what is this joy that's so present in this letter? What is this joy that has taken hold of the apostle that he would say his imprisonment is for Christ? What is this joy that was sufficient for Paul in his suffering? And could we reach out? Could we take hold of such a joy for us today? That's our hope. That's our prayer. And so we're going to pray again, and we're going to ask the Lord to work through this this morning. So, Father, that, that's our prayer, that you would reveal to us something about this joy, this joy that is bigger than the suffering and affliction that Paul faced, this joy that, that he sees and wants to send out and encourage others in. We pray, Father, that you would show us something in your word today that would open up our hearts to you and the way you're working. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would, you would manifest yourself in our midst today, that, that the spirit of truth would go out and that we would be encouraged, that we would be challenged, that we would be transformed to look more like your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. So this study that we're doing through the book of Philippians is, is meant to lift our eyes to the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus. And so every week, our title is, is the gospel is, and then we're going to have a word or a finishing of that sentence because the gospel is an event that happened 2,000 years ago on a cross where Jesus the Christ was crucified. Amen? That was a moment in time in history, an event, but the gospel is also how we live our lives and the filter in which we view the world that we live in today. That's why Paul is going to say in our text today that we would live our lives in a manner worthy of the gospel, that the gospel would go out from this event and transform everything about us. And so this morning, the gospel is worth it. 
That is our title today. As we look at the affliction and the opposition to the gospel in, in this moment in time, we, we want to see the gospel is worth it. Worth it in our own opposition, in our own suffering, in our own circumstances we find ourselves in today. The gospel is worth it. And so as Paul transitions from his opening prayer, where we ended last week, into the body of this letter, he begins by giving his ministry partners an update, not just on his own circumstances, but on the continued work of the gospel. Last weekend, we learned that if it's God's work, then God is at work. And that was true for the Philippian believers in Philippi, but it was also true for Paul in his imprisonment in Rome. If it's God's work, then God is at work, and he is the one that will bring to completion what he has begun. And so verse 13, Paul confirms that he is indeed in jail, but he says his imprisonment is for Christ. Paul has been in Roman custody for some time now, and and he's actually opted into this by way of his Roman citizenship. And his goal, to proclaim the gospel in the very heart of Rome. And this all kind of takes its start in, in Acts 21 when Paul was in Jerusalem and through the scheming of his rivals, Paul was accused of blasphemy amongst other things. And the Jews there were rejecting his teachings. And so Paul was arrested by Roman soldiers, mostly for his own protection, placed into protective custody until things could get sorted out. But Paul saw this opposition as an opportunity for the gospel to go further and begins to proclaim the gospel in his imprisonment to all of these different Roman officials that he could encounter. And ultimately, Paul activates his right as a Roman citizen to have his case heard before the highest court, before Caesar himself. So we we learn this in Acts 25, Paul speaking before officials. He says, if then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with his counsel, answered to Caesar, you have appealed to Caesar, you shall go. And so the remainder of the writings of Acts describe Paul's journey from Israel into Italy and and the, the tales of adventure. I mean, there's shipwreck, there's snake bites, there's so much more. It's worth a read this week. It's just a few chapters, but it's worth a read to understand that when Paul speaks of suffering, that he knows what he's talking about, that he has lived this over and over again in the pursuit of gospel ministry. And so it's worth our time to read throughout the week, especially in our community groups. But, but Paul wants the Philippian believers to know that God is at work. The gospel is at work through suffering. So he begins this section of his letter by saying, I want you to know. Well, what does he want them to know? What are they waiting to hear? Well, it's unknown exactly how long Paul was imprisoned in Rome or which imprisonment this is because he was in and out. But we can assume it's been for some time. Because remember, this letter is a response to the news that Paul has been imprisoned. Now, Rome was about 800 miles from Philippi and would take six to eight weeks of travel. So play this out. The news of Paul's imprisonment is carried over 800 miles, six to eight weeks to Philippi. And the news is delivered. The church comes together, they gather a generous offering, they pick someone from their community to travel 800 miles to Rome. So now we're 1,600 miles. Now we're we're multiple weeks in. And then we're going to read later on in our study that that traveler, that that person from the Philippian church is going to become very ill. It's going to take some time before he's healthy enough to return. And so there's all this back and forth before the Philippians hear any news of how their beloved pastor and friend is doing. And so this is four months later from the initial news that they open this letter and they read and, and Paul says, I want you to know. And everybody leans in because they want to know. And Paul says, I want you to know that the gospel is at work through suffering. In verse 12, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. See, Paul says this this opposition is becoming an opportunity. This, This is creating opportunities that nobody could have anticipated. And he lists three different opportunities that have come because of this. The first one, he says, is is the gospel is at work in the imperial guard. Next, he says, the gospel is at work because the brothers are boldly proclaiming Christ. And then he's going to later on say the gospel is at work because even in the strangest ways, Christ is being proclaimed. So the first display, the gospel is at work in Paul's circumstances because the imperial guard are hearing about Jesus. 
Now, if you remember last week, one of those two confirmed salvations was a jailer, right? Somebody who worked in the jail in Philippi, whose responsibility were the prisoners. And I wonder if he, hearing this letter read, just began to laugh, thinking about how annoying Paul was as a prisoner. All the songs, all the prayers, all the stories about Jesus. And I wonder if he just smiled, thinking about the imperial guard being exposed to the gospel of Jesus. Now, who were these guards? They were most likely the elite group of soldiers assigned to Caesar himself, as well as members of his household and and high-profile individuals throughout the city. This would have been a a group of soldiers that would have been otherwise unreachable by Paul's message. These weren't patrol soldiers. These weren't soldiers who were just out and about in the city of Rome or, or among the empire. These were special forces. And, and yet, because of Paul's circumstances, they are now reachable with this message of the gospel. And Paul says, I have joy because of this joy, because the gospel is spreading even to the imperial guard. A pastor and an author named Sinclair Ferguson wrote about this moment. And I quote, here was a prisoner who prayed and whose heart was full of joy. Here was a prisoner so deeply loved that people visited him from afar in order to encourage him with messages of affection and uh, from his fellow Christians and material gifts to meet his personal needs. No doubt it was not long before the talk among the soldiers was, the only chains that bind this man are the ones by which he is bound to Jesus Christ. And perhaps it was that kind of thinking that leads Paul to say, my imprisonment is for Christ. Could it be that what Ferguson poetically said, that the the only chains that bind him are the chains to Christ? It sounds like Paul. It sounds like the way he writes throughout the other epistles. And he wants the believers in Philippi to know that even in his chains, the gospel is advancing into Caesar's household, an unreachable place to the glory of God. And the next thing Paul wants his gospel partners to know is that most of the brothers have become bold in speaking the word because of Paul's imprisonment. There's a lot that this can mean. The brothers are identified in the Greek language as Adelphos. And and if you're connecting that to Philadelphia, you're on the right track, the city of brotherly love. This word is used throughout the New Testament to describe those who have a bond of affection because of a mutual belief And so Paul is most likely speaking of Christians who have this bond of affection in the city of Rome. I mean, imagine the Roman believers hearing of Paul's witness and his imprisonment, that even the imperial guards are hearing the gospel. And how encouraging that might be to their own witness, that their ability to witness is not based on their circumstances, but their circumstances create an opportunity for witness. I think so many of us, me, I I know I get that way. Like, oh, my circumstances are preventing me from And I think what Paul is showing and what these believers were experiencing is this circumstance is my witness. And Paul says they are speaking with boldness, the word of God. And then next comes this strange portion of scripture. Paul identifies two other motives that Christ is being preached. And the first motivation sounds really strange. In verse 15, he says, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry. Now, I've read through this many times, and you always get to those parts of Scripture, and you go, that's weird. Next. But having to slow down this week and lean into it, it was interesting to try to unravel a little bit. Because how can this be? How can somebody preach Christ out of envy, out of rivalry? And how could Paul rejoice in that, as he will later say? Well, the the Greek word here for envy is, is thonos. It's described by one commentator as the miserable trait of being glad when someone experiences misfortune or pain. As strange as it sounds, there were some people proclaiming Christ out of this motivation, celebrating that Paul is in chains. It's not a false gospel because Paul says he rejoices in it, that Christ is being proclaimed. Paul wouldn't rejoice in a false gospel. So the message is pure, but it's the motivation that's in question. And I think if we stop long enough to think about it, it's really not that hard to understand. I I would guess there are some in this room who maybe recently, maybe in the last few weeks, have been guilty of the miserable trait of being glad when someone else experiences misfortune or pain. 
Maybe you're having a hard time understanding how some people could be so heartbroken over something that you find to be a good thing. Perhaps you've experienced this locally in community. Perhaps you've experienced this domestically on TV or on social media. We are all in danger of this. We're in danger of being glad when we perceive someone has gotten what they deserve. We, we do this in youth group. We, we raise our hands so that nobody feels alone. Um, if you're courageous, have you ever been glad when somebody got what they deserved? Thank you. In youth group, we throw out candy, but we're not in youth group. This is something we are all in danger of. It's a, it's a condition of our heart. It's the sin in our life that, that we think, oh, I'm glad that somebody is getting what they deserve. But really what that reveals about each of us is, is how much we lack in our understanding about what any of us deserve. Because if we really understood what we actually deserve, we would never celebrate somebody getting what they deserve. So Paul brings to our attention this morning that it's possible for us to speak the right words without having the right heart or the right understanding. Jesus warned us of this, recorded in Matthew chapter 7. He said on, on that day, on the day of judgment, on the day when, when the Lord comes back to, to make all things right, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. May it not be so among the saints at eternal church. Amen? Some proclaim Christ out of envy, rivalry, selfish ambition, but Paul also notes that others proclaim Christ out of goodwill, out of love, out of solidarity with Paul and his opposition. And their contrast is clear for the listeners. Some proclaim Christ to benefit themselves. Others proclaim Christ at great cost to themselves. For the good of others and out of love of others. May that be our story at Eternal Church. So Christ is proclaimed. He says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. Paul isn't concerned with the motives at play. Instead, he's content to rejoice that Christ is being proclaimed. How can he feel this way? My, my heart doesn't go there very fast. How can Paul feel this way? How can he rejoice that not only in his physical sufferings, but in, even in his emotional sufferings, those seeking to, to celebrate his affliction, he says, I can rejoice in that. Well, the idea of God's sovereignty is an anchor for much of what Paul will write to the Philippian church. And sovereignty can feel like a really difficult idea to understand, but it's worth the effort. Our friends at the Gospel Coalition define sovereignty like this. Sovereignty, the supreme and independent power and authority. Sovereignty over all things is a distinctive attribute of God. He directs all things to carry out his purposes. And it's perhaps this type of understanding that the Apostle Paul can be confident that the same God who's sovereign over his chains is sovereign over those who celebrate his chains. That, that God who is working all things together for his glory and for the good of those who call upon his name, he, he says, you know what, Christ is proclaimed. I, I want more of that perspective. I want more of that deep trust in the sovereignty of God. I want like what Charles Spurgeon defined when he said, when you go through a trial, the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which you lay your head. Isn't that a great picture? Then the midst of trial and, and affliction and suffering, that belief in the sovereignty of God becomes like a pillow to rest our head when we lie down at night, to sleep in the midst of suffering. So the sovereignty of God becomes an invitation to us in our greatest hardships to rest in who God is and what he has done for us and, and even to rejoice. Paul continues on. He says, yes, and I will rejoice for I know that your prayers and the help of the spirit of Jesus, this will turn out for my deliverance. So having celebrated the ways the gospel is advancing in his suffering, Paul now addresses his own circumstances. This is the question the Philippian believers are desperate to know the answer to. How are you, Paul? How are you faring in all of this? How will all this turn out for you? And so to this question, Paul says that he knows something, he expects something, and he longs to see something. 
He says, I, I know I will be delivered. See, he begins with his greatest hope that because of the Philippians' prayer of encouragement and the ever-present help of the Spirit of Jesus, Paul knows that he will be delivered. But the deliverance that Paul has his eyes on is not a, a physical deliverance from his imprisonment. Instead, he uses a specific word that describes the already but not yet state of his soul. Paul says he knew he would be delivered. He, he used the word soteria in the Greek. And, and it's described, it was one lexicon put it this way, it's the present possession of all true Christians. This means that Paul's ultimate comfort in his affliction is the unshakable knowledge that he is already delivered. Delivered from what? Delivered from his sin? Delivered from this world? Into the tender mercy of God because of the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Paul has confidence that no matter what happens, he has already taken possession of a greater deliverance. Next, he says, I expect that I will not be ashamed. He says, it's, it's my eager expectation and hope. I will not be at all ashamed, but with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body. Again, there's contrast in these words. Paul says it's his hope that he won't be ashamed, but with courage that Christ will be honored. And, and the word for honor there would be better translated exalted. It carries with it the notion of, of deeming something great or esteeming highly, to exalt, to, to laud, to celebrate. And so leaning into this contrast, Paul says that he is expectant that he won't be ashamed and yet that, that even more so Christ will be exalted. Whatever the outcome, Paul's saying, I've surrendered the outcome. So, so I'm not going to be ashamed, but my hope is that through this, Christ is declared great. And this is how he can say, to live is Christ and to die is gain. My great-grandmother passed away a few years ago at 98 and I had the holy privilege, I believe it was a holy privilege, to go see her a week before she passed away. And, and she wanted to talk about her, her funeral service because she had opinions. She was a, an incredible woman. And we had this amazing conversation sitting at the kitchen table where she began to pastor me and explain this idea to me. And it was incredible. And it, and it started with her... <laughs> Open it up. Not, it wasn't a pill box. It was like a pill crate. Because <laughs> she was 98. And she looked at me and she said, Josh, I don't want to take these pills. And she went on to say how she felt like a burden to family, to people around her, people who took care of her, people who were in and out of the house every day, and, and, and even just the toll of taking another pill. And, and how she just really just wanted to go and be with Jesus. But then something pivoted in the conversation. And you can see it in her eyes. You can see it in her posture. Where she began to say, but who am I to challenge the Lord and his plans? Who am I to say that the Lord is done with me? Could it be that he has a purpose for me in these final days at 98? And she began to just explain how her hope had to be in that God's ways are higher than her ways and thoughts are higher than her thoughts. And she believed it to the point that she could say, I've surrendered the outcome. And that if the Lord wants me here longer for some purpose that I can't begin to explain, this is how she ended, then I'll just take these pills and he can have his way. And I just was so moved by that, that, that she had surrendered the outcome. And it filled my heart with joy that a week later, she got to take hold of Jesus, who had taken hold of her. Because to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And I know what you're thinking. She is cooler than your great-grandmother. <laughs> and you don't know the half of it. And if she were here today, she would tell you the same thing she said at the kitchen table. Who am I to disagree with the plans of the Lord? And if he will be exalted through my suffering, then I'm willing to suffer. This is the mindset of Paul. 
Not that it was easy, it wasn't. We can see the processing, the struggling played out in his words. Which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. This is my desire, but I think this is what might actually happen. And, and I love this because let us not buy into the lie that Christians suffer without confusion or without worry or without fear. Because we all experience these emotions. And, and the, the verb Paul uses that's translated hard pressed It's the action of holding two things, one thing in each hand and being pulled between the two. Doesn't that describe the way we process suffering? We hold on to our emotions and our circumstances and our desires in one hand, and then we hold on to Christ crucified and resurrected in the other hand. And this is how a true Christian can surrender the outcome to the sovereignty of God, resting on that truth like a pillow that we lie down on. That God's ways are higher than my ways. Therefore, I can say to live is Christ and to die is gain. And we could spend so much more time here. But, but we'll, we'll do that in groups this week. We'll do that in community this week. We'll do that with a, a meal with somebody else in the church this week. So, so go back to this and pull on that thread more to say, how does that take root in my life? Am I at a point to say to live is Christ, to die is gain? But Paul continues, and so we will continue to. He knows he will be delivered. He expects he will not be ashamed. And he longs to see the believers living out the gospel. I long to see believers living out the gospel. He says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Now, this is not to suggest that Paul says we must be worthy to receive the gospel. No, not at all. He's saying, by grace, we should therefore walk in a way of the gospel. Or to quote our friend Ferguson once again, he says this, that that he does not mean that we must earn God's favor, but that our lives should be consistent with the gospel. Living illustrations of the gospel's power. The principle is one of the keys to the message of the Bible. When the grace of God and the gospel touches our lives, it produces graciousness. Christ begins to transform us into his likeness. I love that, especially those final thoughts, that graced people should become gracious people. Amen? Okay, went the same way in the first service. That means we need to hear this again. In fact, I would challenge me with us, all of us, that we need to listen to this because some of us are not doing this right now in community. So let me read this again. That graced people should be gracious people as Christ transforms us into his likeness. That's for me. That's for you. Last week, we talked about what it means to be in Christ. We could add to that, that being in Christ is to become like Christ day by day. And one of the ways that Paul suggests this happens is that our lives become living illustrations of the gospel's power. How do we do that? How do we live as living illustrations of the gospel? Well, he goes on to say it's, it's when we're not frightened in anything by our opponents. He says, this is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. He says, for it has been granted to you. We'll come back to that. It's been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. I think Paul would say that our lives model the gospel when we begin to see our earthly defeats as eternal victory. It's because he says that sufferings have been granted to believers. It's the gift you really don't want. But he says it's actually for our good. That suffering actually becomes a gift to us bestowed upon us by our heavenly father. And James says that every good gift comes from the father above. And so suffering must therefore be for our good, for those who believe in Christ. Now that could create a lot of confusion. So let me just offer one thought for us. And then we take this to our groups this week and our conversations this week. How can we say that earthly defeats have the potential to be eternal victory? Well, it's because everything about our belief in Jesus Christ is based on an earthly defeat and an eternal victory. 
Next Sunday, Pastor Jacob will lead us through the humility of Christ, this magnificent poem that the entire letter of Philippians is built around. Everything about this letter builds up to and then comes down from this display of the gospel. Everything about our salvation appears at first to be an earthly defeat. God came to earth, walked among us, and we killed him. That's an earthly defeat. But that's not the end of our story. We do not have hope simply because of the death of Christ, but because of what happened three days later when the earth began to shake, when a stone was rolled away, when the physical heart of Jesus began to beat again, when his eyes opened again, when breath filled his lungs. As the hymn says, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain. He lives forever with his saints to reign. This is the eternal victory that follows the earthly defeat. And Paul wants to drive this home in a letter to the Corinthian church. He says, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. That's bad news. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. That's bad news. And if Christ, if we only have hope in his life only, we are people most to be pitied. That's bad news. Like feel the weight of that statement. If Christ has not been raised, then none of this is real. There's no hope in hopelessness. There's no purpose in the pain or whatever tweetable statement we find. If Christ is not raised, Paul says, we should be pitied more than any other people on earth because if Christ is not raised, then what hope is there? What purpose is there? What promise is there for those who suffer? But he continues. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For in Adam all die, but in Christ all shall be made alive, each in his own order. Christ the first fruits. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. This is how earthly defeat becomes eternal victory. This is how we find hope and confidence and expectation in our suffering. We fix our eyes on Christ and we wait for the day when he delivers the kingdom to his father, when every knee will bow, when every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Do we have that hope this morning? Do we know and expect and long for these things? One day every knee will bow, but today is the day of salvation. And so we conclude in worship this morning. We, we want to be available for, for more of this conversation. We'll have elders on the, on the sides up here during worship and after we conclude to, to answer questions about this hope. Because if you're here this morning saying, that sounds great, but I don't have hope like that, then we want to tell you about Jesus. Or maybe you're here this morning, you're saying, that sounds great, but you don't know my suffering. Nobody knows my suffering then we want to pray with you. We want to cry with you. We want, we want you to lean on our shoulders this morning, a faith community together with one mind, one accord, and one spirit in Christ. And so as we worship, we're going to pray that the, the spirit would move us to, to, to surrendering the outcome and the hope, not of an earthly defeat, but of an eternal victory. And so Father God, that is our prayer today. We pray for hope. We pray for such hope that we might rejoice in the midst of our suffering and in our circumstances. Jesus, we, we believe, as a church, we believe that one day you will deliver the kingdom to your Father. You will defeat every power, every position, every authority in this world. You will reign forever eternal. We believe that, Father, but it's hard sometimes to believe that for today. It's hard to believe that when it feels like we just experience earthly defeat after earthly defeat. So give us eyes to see this morning that, Jesus, you are sitting in victory. That this world is your footstool, and yet you stand, you move. Your heart is near our heart and our affliction and our suffering. 
And so we pray for hope this morning, Father, hope for the hopeless, that one might move, Lord, move in faith, move in the desire to know you, to know this Jesus who gives us hope, or or that someone might move to, to share the burden of suffering. And so our hearts are open. We worship you, Jesus, and we want to respond this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen.